Well, welcome this morning. Uh, thank you for being here on this cold morning in February for uh, the actual beginning of the Bible, uh, Genesis. However, and I always seem to say however, before we get to Genesis 1, <coughs> in preparing for Genesis itself, there are uh, several things, lots of things that are covered in here that I should bring to your attention. And um, so there are dates that may be surprising to you unless you've been a student of history. Um, I was not in that degree. Um, the Bible, of course, you know, begins with the story and account of creation. But everything before that is called by historians prehistory, which is uh, makes sense. Um, and so we are going to study for the next foreseeable future the first epoch, epoch one, which is uh, from undateable creation to about 2000 before BC witness the beginning both of life itself and humankind's first civilization. This is the time before the patriarchs. So you have to take yourself far back. This is from the creation. God created the, the universe and then he created the earth. But before any of this happened on earth, before Adam and Eve, before the patri there were no patriarchs as we call them, now, who can tell me who the patriarchs are, were? So it's Abraham, Isaac, Isaac. Jacob. Jacob. He has a book. He's, no. Yeah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's right. Yeah, Those were what we call the patriarchs, the fathers of the faith. Um, now, of course, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Who wrote, who do the, most scholars agree wrote those books of the Bible? Moses. Moses, that's correct. And what were they about, really? The forming of Israel. In fact, the whole Old Testament really is about the history of the forming and, and movement of Israel as God's promised people. I said not chosen, I said promised people, because there are scriptures that say, these are my promised children. We'll, we'll come to that later. Writing started taking place, and I think this is, this is important. I don't know what you have to do, so I can't see it. Um, that's not it yet. So writing started taking place in about 3000 BC. So everything before 3000 BC is either A, conjecture, or B, has to do with the tools in which the people who live used. So this is these are called the ages. We are most familiar with what term? The Stone Age. Yeah. The Stone Age. <laughs> but that is one of just several. Uh, I was surprised to learn. In reading about this, um, they archaeologists arrange historical and cultural evidence according to the most vital metal of each period. So, there was stone and copper and bronze and iron. The Stone Age is the earliest <coughs> period, of course, Stone Age, <coughs> and then it's divided into early, middle, uh, well, let's say, a, a new, middle. And uh, old, middle, and new Stone Age. That's the way they divided that. that that's, now, that's chronological people. That's, that's archaeologists and people like that. And why do we care about all this? Why are we going to go through this today? Because if we don't understand what built up to the time of the birth of Christ and what the world was like, then we don't have as good an understanding, as complete an understanding of when Christ was born and what happened shortly thereafter. It's hard to understand the world of Christ, of Jesus, if we don't understand the world before Jesus. So that's why this is important. Now, the old Stone Age 
has been told, you probably learned this in, in schools at some point, it was called the Paleolithic Age. Um, it was hunting and food gathering. They lived in, people lived in caves and shelters. This is before 10,000 BC. So we don't think about that much, I mean, unless you're a historian or an archaeologist or someone, because in church, <clears throat> we think about the beginning is the birth of Jesus Christ. However, I think one of the most, let me go on, I'll come back to that. And then there was the middle, they made implements of flint or chipped stone, and they still find those things this day. And then there was a middle stone age, Mesolithic, and that was a traditional uh, stage, a transitional stage to a food producing economy. So just, just think about that. They had they used they they hunted, and they gathered, but they didn't produce. They didn't produce. And then the New Stone Age or Neolithic is distinguished by several advances. One of the most notable is the invention of pottery. Now, why do we talk about that? Well, there was nothing to hold anything in, so they invented pottery. And when does pottery first really show up in? Uh, the life of Jesus? Exactly. Congratulations. Yeah. Exactly. So again, that that started. Um, there was a pre-pottery period, and then the pottery period began 5,500 to 4,000 BC. So for 4,500, 5,000 years before Christ is when pottery wow. began, and we hear about it. In the Bible, and now we hear. So here's what we hear: the phrase in the Old Testament you hear is "earthen vessels." You will hear that often as we read the Old Testament: "earthen <coughs> vessels, vessels of clay." But before about four, five thousand BC, none. They hadn't come to that yet. They hadn't come up with it. And then, of course, after that was. Uh, and, and after pottery, they also developed in the same about the same time textiles and the domestication of animals. Now think about that. <clears throat> Five thousand years before Christ, they finally understood how to domesticate animals. What does domesticate animals mean to us? I'm sorry. Tame them. Tame them and use them like milk from. Mm -hmm. Cattle or goats, uh, you know, how to use Burr. them, how to use them for their mm -hmm. benefits, and not just kill them for the meat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's really what we're talking about here. And uh, and then the next, so the next thing was about four thousand to three thousand for about a thousand years was the copper stone age, uh, and it was a transition to the significant use of copper. Uh, because many of the sites where people lived were underground. Mm -hmm. They were underground dwellings or cave dwellings. Mm -hmm. And so they found in those places veins of copper. Like many years later in America and West Virginia and other places, they found coal mines and veins of coal. In Africa, they found what? Veins of yeah. gold. diamonds and gold. Yeah. That's right. So. This is, this is, I think, pretty interesting. And then uh, they entered these underground places where they lived by shafts. They dug shafts or tunnels into these. And so copper working was found in pits, and, uh, and then they used it in ovens and fireplaces and things like that. And then the next was the early Bronze Age. It's the period in which we leave what is called prehistory because when did I say writing started? 3000 BC. So now we've moved from the copper period, we've moved to um, the early, what they call the Bronze Age. There's several different ones in there, but the Bronze Age. And that is when 
historic history started to be written. Now, <laughs> in this, who were the first to really do writing? Egyptians. Wrong. But good guess. You were close. Mesopotamian. Mesopotamians, say that three times in my second, is um, they were the first, but they didn't use it well. They they wrote down however they did in whatever fashion that's beyond my our issue here. But they wrote, but they didn't use it. Now who was the next group who really understood how to use it? Back to you, Tom. Egyptians. Yeah. Because they started doing writing what with it? History. There was there wasn't much hit everything before then, before three thousand BC, history was hand mouth mouth to mouth. There was nothing, you know. Uh, 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 and so then um, at the site of Arad in Palestine, archaeologists have uncovered a pod shirt bearing the signature of Narmer, who's identified with Minas, the pharaoh of Egypt's first dynasty. Way beyond our way beyond my comprehension really most of this is is now for people who study this in college and things they, they, they get it but but that's that's sort of where we are now we're at uh, 2000 to 2000 and and on so the the story of the Bible is linked with the histories of two great lands the story of the Bible Mesopotamia and Egypt and then those turn into Israel, mm -hmm. and then the other parts of the of what we call the Middle East or the Near East. Some, some people call it the Near East. I, that's not a term I was familiar with. Now, let me give you just a, this is out of my life, so um, this, this might be slightly interesting to you. So that these periods were judged by stone and then copper, and, and bronze, when you buy a casket, <laughs> okay, and you go into a room to buy a casket, the most expensive, set aside wood like like uh, uh, mahogany and things like because that's the most expensive wood, mahogany. But when you're talking about metal, the, the, less, the least expensive casket in metal is what's called 20 gauge metal. Some of you will know that the gauge or thickness of the metal. 20 <coughs> gauge is the thinnest. The next gauge they use most of the time is 18 gauge. It's a little thicker. And then 16 gauge or what are stainless steel. Stainless steel didn't come about until very late in the game because of what? What happened that caused stainless steel to become popular? The kitchens. Mm. Exactly. So funeral directors always being behind me. Curve. He said, oh, if people like stainless steel, we'll have caskets of stainless steel. Not important to this, I'm sure. But but here's the thing. The most expensive caskets were copper, and at the top, bronze, and they still are. So those were taken from this time, and for all these years, those have still become the, the most expensive metals other than of course gold but gold's not really what what you it's not in the same they don't make that so but the copper and bronze so if you were to go to a funeral home right now and say i want the best casket you have and if they don't show you a mahogany casket they're going to show you a bronze casket and right and you say that's a little more less more than i want to spend let's go a little lower they're going to take you to a copper casket and then after that it's 16 gauge and on down so my, my only point is to say that these terms are long-lasting, are far-lasting, and we're still using them today. When they were there five, seven, ten thousand years before Christ, in that that's pretty fascinating. And and I, I think I wouldn't have learned all that had I not had not done this. Now, the earliest known inhabitants of Mesopotamia lived in the southern part. The land of Sumer or southern Babylonia. We know about, of course, the Babylon. And then uh, and then the Sumerians developed a township system of government. But this is what's interesting about them. 
So, again, Jesus would not have gone to, born in, in Bethlehem or gone to Nazareth before that. They didn't have town, before this, they didn't have townships. They didn't have a government system. They just lived in the dirt. They just lived on the land. There was no borders. There were no nothing. But the Sumerians developed a township system of government, a city and state, and then they had a temple with a local deity. This is before people understood. So then, and that local deity, or I'm not, don't use deity as the word of a god. Deity would be, well, it would be like a mayor, a mayor. And they would have a mayor, and then they would have, that's where people would go and, and gather for their important news. Just like if you watched Little House on the Prairie, they always sort of either met at, used to, well, always people met up until the last, I don't know, 75 years. The church was the center of town. The cemetery was at the church. How many of you have relatives that are buried in a church cemetery? Almost, almost, most people do. Not, not now, not so much in the, down here, but, but they do. Um, and almost every movie you see that has an old church in it, you see the old cemetery. And so that's the way. So the, the center of the of the of their state of their city was built around the church. The church was on the town square. When you watch a show like Little House on the Prairie, or you watch a show like whatever it would be, you always when when the picture opens, it's always sees the church right there, and it's usually on a hill. <laughs> Next time you watch TV shows. Hallmark's famous for it. If you watch the opening fly into a Hallmark movie, you will see this, and there's the church right down the end of Main Street up on the hill. I think they show the same one for every 500 Hallmark movies, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the thing. So, um, so then, in northern Babylonia, instead of Samaria, were the Akkadians, and it took its name from the town of Agade, cultural name also be called Akkadian. The Akkadian culture did not develop independent cities or systems of the south, but existed as a single territory. While there were temples, the palace and household played the more important role in the Akkadian economy. Around 2300 BC, a northerner, well, it's always a northerner, named Sargon of Agade was able to unify north and south Babylonia. Egypt was divided into two kingdoms, Lower Egypt and Upper Egypt. Duh. And what were Lower and Upper Egypt? Well, one was, Lower was, the Nile Valley. And Upper Egypt, Upper Egypt, Upper Egypt, uh, let's see, Lower Egypt. No, that, I'm sorry, this is wrong. Yeah, where yeah. was the Delta? Nile Delta. Delta. The, Nile Delta. Yeah. And, and Upper was the Nile Valley. And those two made up the division of Egypt. And so the Pharaohs were considered an incarnation of the sky god Horus and later pharaohs of the Old Kingdom beginning about 2700 BC started building what? The pyramids. pyramids. So the pyramids started about 2700 BC. It's kind of surprising. All this went on before Christ. And we sort of think about Christ as you know, beginning was the word. So let's go to that for a second. I've talked about it before. I don't think we can't solve this, and there's no definition of it. But here's my first challenge to the Chronological Study Bible, and maybe you all have some thoughts on it. So every year, every day, Sunday, we read the final gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Or the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, it says, in the prologue of St. John. However, the Bible starts in the beginning. 
God created the heavens and the earth. Which comes first? God. Why? Because in the beginning, the Word was with God and, and was God. So why isn't it first in this Bible? Because John didn't say it until many, 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 many years after. Yeah, but they redid the Bible. Oh, in this yes. Bible, I don't yeah, know. Chronological, chronological I don't, I, I don't know. Why would, they, why would they have not moved that? In, 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 the the first. in the beginning was the Word. Yeah. And the Word was God, was with God and the Word was God. Why wouldn't know. they put that there? I don't, I don't know, know the answer. I don't know. I wouldn't. Well, I don't know the answer. <laughs> they were waiting for John to say it. <laughs> Bingo. It, it would have made sense to me to have taken the prologue to John and started the chronological study Bible with that. Yes. Because from my understanding of it, the prologue to John, no matter who God talked to, no matter who said it, what he said, the words he said, tell me that it was the all-encompassing before anything. Before the heavens and the earth. Before anything we can comprehend. Before anything that we can even imagine, there was God. And I think that's extremely hard to understand. I've always thought that's one of the reasons we read the prologue every Sunday. That's what they call it the final gospel in, in, in Sunday. Is that it is very hard to understand that whatever you think you can imagine as the beginning, what is it they talked about? Of, uh, Brian, you'd be able to tell us probably more about this, but there was the, the, the combustion. The, the Big Bang. The Big Bang. The Big Bang. Before the Big Bang was God. Where was God? God is always God is always and forever without beginning or end. Who created God? Nobody. Nobody. How did God come about? Always and forever. No, you're not answering the question. How did God come about? I'm not saying I have an answer. I'm, I'm playing. I played this devil's advocate game with. Bishops and senior priests everywhere. So if God was first, I'm not saying he wasn't. I'm saying he wasn't God first. He was always. There's no well, beginning. Okay, there. but but always is created by. Did he create himself? He just was. No. He just was. <laughs> that's that's what it is. It is what it is. There's a bar. There's a There's a There's a There's a I get that. Your mind around. It, 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 it's, it's, it's impossible. It's impossible to put your mind around. I think you have to accept it. It's one of the, the things that I would say, more than some others, is a tenet of our faith, is that we start by believing that God was first, last, and always. God was first, will be last, and will be always. And that God was there. But that doesn't make me want to know how that happened. Um, there are many questions throughout Scripture that I think this will help us with that, that challenge those kinds of things. And I wouldn't challenge them necessarily from a pulpit, but I would challenge them in here in a discussion. Um, when we say, so here's, here's another instance. We say that we come on, we come to worship God and to, um, I, and I, so I understand giving thanks to God for the blessings of our life. But if God is God, why would God need to be worshipped? Because, and I say this to follow that up before you answer me, the need to be worshipped, the need to be paid attention to, the need to this, the need to, those are human conditions. Mm -hmm. But he needs us to worship, not for him, but for us. That's uh, part of the deal. That's how you get to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. <laughs> that's, that's, our, that's our... First of all, I don't think it has anything to do with getting to heaven, but, I, but we can talk about that. Uh, there's only one thing that gets us to heaven. Well, I know, but he was leading us to that. And if we don't believe in God, how are we ever going to believe in Jesus? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> but what's important is to believe that 
that Jesus died for our sins, right. not how he how he came about. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just saying. <laughs> so, but there are there are numerous questions like this throughout the Holy Scripture. We we say them in the creed. We say them all the time. But when you start thinking about them, I think. I believe if you are a thinking person, not Mark, this Mark's not. Mark is a practical person, and I think that's good. You're our you're our token practical here. That's good. We've got a job, but I think that we ought to think about these questions. Of these are theological questions, and I think we ought to think about them because if we don't, it's okay to to have faith and blindly accept. I'm not saying not to do that. I have that. And the ultimate thing is it won't matter because we'll be in heaven. And then I'll, you know how people say, boy, when I get to heaven, do I have a, I have some questions for God. You know, one of them is why does God let children die? You know, why does God let the, the bad live forever and the, and the good die young? Why does God allow a flood? Why does God allow, not the one he started, but why does he allow <coughs> weather to ruin people? All those questions we I'm going to ask him about that when I get there. No, you're not. Not because you couldn't, I maybe, but because when you get to heaven, it's the most perfect place it's there ever to yeah. be. And, and you're not even going to care about that stuff. Yeah, right. I'm not going to be up here caring to ask God about all this. Awesome. I'm going to be just, I'm just going to be uh, in heaven and awed and overcome and overwhelmed. But that doesn't mean that here on earth, learning and understanding more about the Bible and God's way and how God moves. It's not important to say to yourself, I have questions. Mm -hmm. If we stop having questions, then we stop digging deeper into Scripture. If other, uh, then what happens is we do what they, I'm going to not say this way, we, we tend to do over and over and over by road the same thing. And I don't, I'm not talking about the liturgy. I'm talking about, you know, mm -hmm. One of the things I like about the three-year lectionary cycle is we hear way more scripture than we used to hear in the 28 prayer book over and over and over and over every year, the same scripture over and over and over. I get what they did that for, but I think we are better off to hear a three-year cycle and hear a broader group of scriptures. So, you know, we and then, then we know more. So I'm just saying that. Um, uh, and so today, let me go back to what we were talking about earlier. Today, we still have town squares. We're going to town square in Kerrville. We have town squares. That began a long time ago with the Sumerians. Town squares started with the Sumerians. A long time ago. And so then, after Egypt was divided and, and that happened, then they became famous for their pyramids. Now, let's get to Genesis. Now, you, I've got you kind of up to Genesis. So, the book of Genesis is divided at Genesis 12 in a chronological study, in a, in a, in a theological study. So, the books of Gen the chapters of Genesis 1 through 11, which concern the time before the patriarchs, before those three patriarchs, the time before those, are called <coughs> primeval history. You don't have to remember that, there's not a test. Primeval history. But now, because they relate to ages of the world, much different from after the patriarchs and what they would experience. The major narratives of primeval history give us an account of creation. This is Genesis 1 through 11 now, we're talking about chapters 1 through 11. They give us an account of creation, a great flood, and the tower at Babel. That's the three things mm -hmm. other than what they give us. And of course, they also, at some point, will get into, you know, Garden of Eden and, and all of that. The creation account describes the creation of all things, including humankind. And then, of course, you know from there, if we were to read it in the book of Genesis, it would say, uh, it tells us how, you know, on the first day and on the second day and on the third day, and then God rested. And so, in the, let's talk now about briefly about the beginning of human civilization. The 
earliest large communities developed in Mesopotamia. What it, where is Mesopotamia, by the way? I keep saying it. Where, what would it be? Euphrates and Iraq. Iraq right. and Iran. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Iraq and Iran. That is Mesopotamia back then. Um, then Palestine, where biblical Israel is found, lies along the best road between Mesopotamia and Egypt. Everything was walk or ride a donkey, basically. So they picked the best road. This is before, this is before the Romans, with their systems of highways and aqueducts and all of those things that that happened. This is way we're not we're not near there. So these mm -hmm. folks, when they say a road, what are they talking about? Trail. Dirt trail. Path. That's right. Path. Mm -hmm. the, so they yeah. say the oxymoron, the best road. You know. <laughs> Is uh, that's what they're they're talking about, and di dates are di difficult. Even this study Bible says that it's difficult. Um, so the Bible's own history begins with two civilization centers, you know, Mesopotamia, and then the, is where and then where uh, and then Egypt. Then to try and put dates on that is even more difficult. The first human settlements are thought to be as early as 7,000 to 8,000 years before Christ, but it's very difficult to prove that. That's, that's more than we can take on here. Advances in technology made it possible for humans to live in large communities, and then it, it goes on to tell some of the things that we talked about, the Bronze Age, all of those things. And then here's the question I have from all of this. Until Genesis happens, why didn't God make himself known? In all those years, that's right, in all those years that we've talked about, in all those ages, in all of that, you know, 10,000, 7,000, why didn't God make himself known? I think, he, I think it was because he waited for man to become intellectually able to accept the concept of God. To begin with, uh, furthermore, I, I answer the other question that we ask, is who created God? Well, and then in, in reading back or thinking back to when writing was established and, and these tools to communicate the concept of God, I have a... a, a I had a sixth grade geography teacher, Mr. Carter, and he, he, he said there are three basic things that human beings have to have. Air, water, and God. Fire. Oh, air, water. Uh, fire. Okay, that's four. But those those were the things, and I don't think they had fire early on, except as was created by nature. And so... Um, well, my answer to your question is, is they weren't able to comprehend. They weren't able to com comprehend. So I, I I don't disagree with that. The question I come back to in, in, in a discussion like this is, why didn't God make them able to comprehend it? He created them. He created everything. Why didn't He create them on the ground running? Yeah. Um, why did He give us free? It's not a challenge. I'm just asking the question yeah, out loud to the group. I, I understand what Tom's saying, and I don't disagree with it at all. But why would God? Because it has to be a choice. He gave us free will. We were created with free will, right? We are, yes. So uh, the opportunity is there, but it's ultimately up to us to choose. Now, they had to work for something. They had to, and I think it created appreciation. I mean, when you work on a very low level like they started out, you know, just gathering, you know, hunting and gathering oh, what you could sense. find, and then later on progressing, you know, to using animals to their use. Every time they advanced, they probably appreciated more of what they had. Uh, and, so, and then it says in Genesis that God breathed the Spirit into Adam. Prior to that, there would have been no Spirit of God. There would have been no way for them to perceive God because God is spiritual. You have to perceive him spiritually. So when he breathed life into Adam, 
He breathed the knowledge of God. But he could have breathed that life into somebody else. But the first time, the first time we hear about God is in Egypt. Right? They created a God to worship. The different, Pharaoh. A different God, yes. Yeah, a different God. They didn't know about God. But they knew the concept. But they but how did they what made them come up with this term God? Uh, or God in this God that they created. Well, that's why I used the word earlier, deity. Yeah. Um, they they had they had people who I I call them like mayor, like we would think of a mayor, a, 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 a person, someone who was in was over everybody for however reason. Maybe they're the strongest or the toughest. If you've been watching Jack Reacher on TV or whatever they are, uh, you know they, they they're the toughest. And maybe they were the people in charge. I don't know the answer. But maybe yeah. because um, somewhere earlier in this talk we've been having about this book, you said that, and I can't remember exactly the context it was said in, but there was a point where you said that God was trying to, when the people were all worshiping different things, the sun, the weather, the you know all of this, that there was this point where God was trying to make it that He is God, the only God, and that was a point of, like Tom said, intellectual ability to uh, to grasp that. But in the prophecies uh, and the prophecy part of the Bible, God tells people about who He is. Yeah. You know, there's people that He can uh, that you can yeah. hear His that get His word or yeah, He speaks to, right? So, so perhaps it's why people have to tell about him too. You know. yeah. So do we agree that when God created Adam, that was the first man? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Now, okay, good. Mm -hmm. Now, if God created Adam, and we've just heard, I've given you a litany of all the things of the ages where people worked with it and worked with that and worked with that. In what year was Adam created? The first year. What year one? Year one. Year one. He doesn't need any help, by the way. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four. Then, I mean, I, I, and I'm, I know you don't know, you don't know the answer. No, I don't know the answer. But here's the thing: if the if the timeline begins with Genesis one, so here's what I'm trying to say to you. Now, I'm not the person that has answered this. I'm digging into this just like you are as I prepare this. But the answer, the question is. All these things that I've we spent, and this is why I spent so much time on the Bronze Age, the Stone Age. Was Adam the Stone Age? We see the Stone Age, no, and we Barney think Rubble. of these gorilla-like people. No. Barney Rubble was Barney Rubble. Yeah, yeah. thank you, <laughs> Fred. Fred, 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 Fred. Fred. No, that was a different Fred. show. Fred. Okay, but, but my point is, where did yes, sir, Brian? My. My concept, and it's strictly the way I rationalized this from years ago, <clears throat> is that God created the Garden of Eden as a model of what he wanted man to be. In the meantime, he's letting individuals people evolve. There is no difference because God is all-encompassing between the scientific ability to analyze and the ability of God to synthesize. He's, he, 
So you have two things going on at the same time. Right. Not, not, I think that's a good theory. I, I put it this way. I wrote it just to summarize. So there's creation, and then God in the middle of creation, I'm just using that as a term, <laughs> put in this model you're talking about, the Garden of Eden of the way we're going to live. Now in Genesis, though, it says, God said, let there be light. God said, let there be light. God said, let me get to it just a second here. I'm coming to it. And then God... And God created, so in verse 27 of chapter 1, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created the male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in numbers. I'm just cutting it short yeah. there. So God created mankind. So if God created mankind in Genesis 1, who are these people living here? Mm -hmm. the bronze things? Yeah. We remember the pictures we see of the people bent over these, you know, and they've got the long hair and they, the you know, they're, the eye and the they're drilling, they're, they're, they're dragging the, the oxen behind yeah. them after they've slaughtered it. Yeah. Is that this? No. And then, because it says God created mankind in his own image. So, What's the situation there? God created that for Adam and Eve first. So God then created, all the rest of this yeah, came after. Came they, this is later that that after Adam and Eve. So would you, Brian, go with the idea that this was first, and as long as they lived in here and did what God said, this was the perfect Garden of Eden. And then then when that fell apart. All of this was the outcome of that. Would that be right? Well, I'm just asking the question. I'm not, I'm not having an answer. The, the Hebrew Bible says that the ejection of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden after participating in the fruit was actually an act of mercy. Because if they had remained in the Garden of with the knowledge from the tree that they would have turned and, and they're evading God because they have knowledge of their own nakedness. See, we don't it, know what... It, it would have turned the Garden of Eden into a living hell. Sure. And, and that's why it was an act of mercy to to put them out with the the other evolved m versions of mankind. Where did Cain and Abel get the wives from? In the evolved humans. God is not restricted in how he develops things. No more than the mechanic is restricted in how he designs an autopsy. So you're saying there were other people and then God created Adam and Eve. Right. No, I'm getting all screwed up here. I'm saying you know. that while they were in the Garden of Eden, he was also experimenting with the rest of the world. Rest of the world. This part. Has it evolved? This part. Well, but there's a junction there. Sure. I think. So, has this been interesting? Yeah. yeah. I know you're not. You don't have answers. Yeah. Want. That's okay. We, we've be, got a long time to get to the answers. <laughs> if we ever get to, I'm gonna have to bring in somebody a lot smarter than me to give us answers. But I don't know if there is a definite answer. That's the other thing. It, no, and that says that, that it says that in here that there are some situations that they just can't define. And that's where faith comes in. So next Sunday, we've got 10 minutes to go, so, I mean, before it's church. So next Sunday, we will finish this part and talk about uh, some more about the book of Genesis and move in, move in further into... Uh, and move it further into Genesis. So I would say to you, 
read the first three or four chapters of Genesis. And uh, and we'll go from there. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> the problem is, man's been wrestling with that.